Hello, good evening, Tansi. Um, my name is Sakawis Nobis, and I'm Plains Cree Soto of the George Gordon First Nation. And I am the executive director of Great Plains Action Society. Uh, we're an indigenous led um, uh, climate and social justice organization working uh, across Iowa and Eastern Nebraska. Uh, and frankly, uh, all over the country in many different uh, capacities. And uh, we are here today to talk about uh, the missing and murdered indigenous relatives crisis um, uh, and violence uh, in Indian country and how that is affected uh, by uh, uh, man camps or uh, you know, temporary workforce housing uh, situations um, such as, uh, you know, pipelines um, and, and, and other uh, man type activities like uh, sporting events and uh, hunting camps and how that affects uh, people throughout the area. Um, and the reason we're having uh, this conversation today is because uh, we've been working on uh, stopping uh, this uh, eminent threat uh, to Indian country and throughout the Midwest, which is uh, CO2 pipelines, also known as carbon capture and sequestration. Um, uh, and these are a new green washing tactic proposed by the fossil fuel industry and the ethanol industry and basically big oil and um, big egg uh, to uh, prolong the lives of uh, these very harmful uh, industries. And these pipelines are not just like, you know, a one shot deal where they go straight across like the Dakota Access Pipeline did. Uh, they're an intricate web um, of pipelines that like connect to uh, fossil fuel plants, um, like, car well, not necessarily yet to um, uh, coal plants, but the possibility to ethanol plants, to fertilizer plants, like uh, places that uh, contribute a lot of CO2 into the air and then it liquefies the CO2, um, brings it into these pipelines and then it, uh, the point is to dump it somewhere underground. Um, so right now in Iowa, uh, and Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minneapolis, and Illinois, there are three pipelines right now proposed. That is Summit, uh, Navigator, and Wolf Pipelines, which um, are going to be going through a lot of Indian country in Nebraska, Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, and uh, Minnesota. Uh, and we thought it was prudent and very important to talk about like the effects that these kinds of uh, projects have um, in our communities um, because we know that they they do have um, a very very severe effect in fact um, so we're gonna have some special guests uh, speak with us uh, today uh, concerning um, this this new project but also to talk about like things that are already happening uh, in terms of like large groups of, of men or people coming into our communities and causing harm, uh, you know, increasing sex trafficking um, and uh, just overall violence um, in general. Um, so we'll have Tanya uh, Grassell, uh, and I, please excuse me, because I just realized, Tanya, I did not clear this with you. Uh, Tanya Grassell uh, Kretlow, um, who uh, works with, who is the FAST grant manager of the South Dakota Network Against Family Violence and Sexual Assault, and Lisa Heth, um, who is the executive director of Wachoni, uh, and I apologize because I didn't actually clear this word either, Wachoni Wawakia, um, which is a project safe shelter 
in South Dakota, and Trisha Ottringer, um, who is the MMIR and Operations Director for Great Plains Action Society, speak um, about uh, issues uh, in Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota um, that we need to look out for as we uh, gear up for these pipelines to come through. Um, because right now we are fighting to stop them, but as we all know, um, it is a very eminent possibility that they're going to come through. And so at least we can be prepared and start communicating to everybody what is going on. Um, I'm gonna do a very short uh, talk here uh, before everybody gets on stage um, to uh, just bring, bring up the topic uh, of the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives crisis. Um, you know, this relentless colonization that we faced has caused, um, um, you know, excessive harm to our, uh, our, our ourselves, our bodies, and the land. Um, and we call that the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives or women's crisis. Um, I like to use the term relatives. It's more inclusive of non-binary um, and trans folks. Um, and, you know, I, I want to talk about the effects that temporary workforce housing has, um, also known as man camps, has um, on our communities. Um, James Anaya, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous People, stated, Indigenous women have reported that the influx of workers into Indigenous communities as a result of extractive practices also led to increased incidence of sexual harassment and violence, including rape and sexual assault. Um, he said this a few, quite a few years ago already. Um, so the UN is aware of it. Um, Indian country is certainly aware of it. And, you know, recently, even the federal government has finally taken some action, though I have to say not nearly enough, um, to begin to recognize how severe of an issue this is. Um, and, you know, in, for instance, Fort Berthold Indian Reservation, um, which is located in the middle of the Bakken oil fields, where um, actually Summit, Summit uh, will be going to that area uh, near uh, Bismarck, um, the, there was a 70% increase of federal case filings between 2009 and 2011 uh, during the Bakken oil boom. According to uh, uh, a report uh, released in 2017, there is a correlation between an increase in violence and the oil boom. Um, it stated that since this boom happened, Native American communities have reported increased rates of human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking, and missing and murdered Indigenous women in their communities. Um, not only that, but um, there's a corridor uh, between Sioux Falls uh, and Omaha, like where this pipeline will be going specifically, um, where there's very high rates uh, of missing and murdered Indigenous women. Uh, for instance, uh, Omaha is um, uh, eighth in the nation for um, cities uh, with missing and murdered Indigenous women. Right now, there are uh, 24 missing Indigenous women in Omaha. Um, and the state of Nebraska is number seventh in the nation for states. Um, you know, Sioux City has um, uh, a population of Indigenous people that's only about 2%, which is actually kind of a high population, to be honest, for some, like, for a lot of our cities here um, in the U.S. Uh, but the houseless population is made up of 45 to 63% Indigenous people. So, you know, we are living in areas where there are vulnerable people. Um, and then, you know, you go further up into, you know, Sisseton Wapatin and uh, the Hwangtuan Reservation and um, uh, many others in the area. And, and these pipelines will be going through these areas. So um, it's just, it's really important that we, you know, say that there's going to be a lot of people, men in particular, coming into the area and um, causing um, harm. Um, and Trisha Ottringer will talk a lot more about like what's going on in the Nebraska, you know, area and, and so, and everybody else will talk about what's going on in their areas later as well. Um, so, you know, there's also a lack of informed cons consultation going on through the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Local tribes have really been consulted, um, very little, in fact, um, we know this firsthand, um, as an Indigenous organization that's been working on the ground since, like, you know, the beginning of this issue, um, we had to push really, really hard to get like these conversations going in some cases. Um, and it's, it's, it's ridiculous that even Summit in a meeting with them, with like one of the nations that was consulted, they did not know on their own map, 
where the nation was that they were speaking with at the moment. So there is a huge lack of representation going on, a huge lack of consultation um, with the tribes specifically from the company or like from like the federal even state governments. Um, uh, what is going to happen in terms of tribal emergency response? Because these pipelines can be very dangerous to our health and safety. Uh, these are CO2 pipelines. If CO2 um, leaks or explodes out of these pipelines, um, it basically uh, displaces oxygen. And uh, the only way to be okay is to essentially have a uh, oxygen tank next to you um, so that you can you know, breathe. Um, and right now there are no safety protocols set up for this type of uh, infrastructure to go uh, throughout, like <laughs> to, to go the thousands of miles that it will be traveling. Um, and uh, so that's, that's a huge problem as well, um, because there was already um, a disaster in Satarshia, Mississippi, um, where a largely black town was uh, highly affected by this and 100 people were um, hurt. And I think about 40 people ended up in the hospital. So, you know, this, this, this actually, these, these pipelines are, are dangerous. Um, and it's also, you know, of course, we're going to experience environmental racism concerning these pipelines. So, you know, we have to be very careful. Um, and then, you know, there's the economics of these, you know, who is going to receive the benefits from these pipelines in the end? Will tribal nations receive them? Most likely not. Um, and so we want to talk about these pipelines in the larger context of the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives crisis. And we have experts that work on the ground all the time with people in the communities that they're in that are helping and have been helping for a long time that can talk more clearly about like what our communities are already facing in terms of the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives crisis and like what that means if we're going to be adding on top of that. Um, and so I'm going to bring up uh, our first guest, uh, and <laughs> Tanya. I'm so sorry if I butchered your name. I <laughs> can you please correct me? You did me? well. You did. It's Tanya Grassel Kreitlow. I don't know why I decided to hyphenate. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's all good. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, and if you don't mind, um, I'll let you introduce yourself and um, talk on the, the the subject of KXL and the sex trafficking work and everything else you've been working on in South Dakota. Absolutely. Um, my name is Tanya. I am a grants manager with the South Dakota Network Against Family Violence and Sexual Assault. The grant that I manage is, the we call it FAST. Um, but it stands for Sexual Assault Forensic Medical and Advocacy Services for Tribes Initiative. So it's an initiative, um, not a grant, which means it's a one-time funding. What happened was um, OVW took a look at what had happened at Bakken, the plea that was made to OVW because of what was happening, the lack of resources and what resources they had were drained and stressed to the capacity. And so when we looked at what was going to happen in South Dakota with the Keystone XL pipeline, they um, released this grant. And so the grant itself was a special initiative designed to increase the availability of trained sexual assault forensic examiners and trained sexual assault advocates in tribal communities, including Alaska Native villages. It was developed through a partnership between OVW and the Office of Justice Programs Office for Victims of Crime which provide funding for the initiative. The original scope of the project was the geographical areas along the Keystone XL pipeline in Western South Dakota. So as you all know, the key, TC Energy abandoned the Keystone XL pipeline. So the hope was at that point that the FAST grant could be open to all tribal partners. So we had the unique ability because of COVID and because the, um, stall in the decision of what to do with that pipeline to really listen to our tribal partners and listen to um, our other partners on the grant to see what was happening in our community, to look at trends and to respond to those trends um, with the blessing of OBW, of course. And so after we did that, we learned that the missing and murdered indigenous um, issue was off the charts. We don't have the statistics um, to back that up, because that's a whole nother issue, which I'm sure um, Christine will share with you later. But there is no accurate database to capture federal statistics when it comes to um, our missing and murdered Indigenous relatives. 
And so we knew that we needed to start somewhere to um, educate our communities on this issue, educate our tribal um, law enforcement and our advocates so they could work together. So if they saw something, they would say something, identify resources across the state. If we didn't have them develop them, if we didn't have the advocates hire them, and then lastly, come up with a mechanism to track what um, we were actually seeing so that when we had conversations with um, people outside of our world, for example, we could speak in terms of statistics to back up our anecdotals. Um, and so we have hired advocates. We have opened it up to all nine tribes um, in South Dakota. We have partners both on and off the reservation because of the nomadic nature um, of our victims, because of the location of the, um, the proposed man camps at that time. And because um, so many of us now live off reservation that we wanted to ensure that um, our victims of, and survivors had the same access to culturally appropriate care both on and off the reservation. This is uh, largely in South Dakota. My, yes, this grant is specifically South Dakota. We worked with our partners up in North Dakota with a coalition, um, but this grant is specific to the South Dakota side of what would have been the, um, the Keystone XL pipeline. Can you also give us a little bit more info on like why this, like about why it was started, you know, cause like what, what were the issues that you saw surrounding the KXL pipeline that made you want, made people want to have this grant? Well, the, the first thing that we looked at was just South Dakota and in general. And it's a South Dakota is a very rural state. It's about 75, almost 76,000 um, square miles with a population of just under 900,000, which means it's only about 11, 12 people per square mile. It's mostly farming and ranching, and it's home to nine of our tribes. Um, the Keystone Pipeline was going to be on the western side of South Dakota, which is our South Dakota is divided by the Missouri River. The only urban area in that part of the state is Rapid City. And um, the original pipeline was going to run parallel to the river and skirt three of our largest reservations. So we took a look at what was happening, what had happened um, in back in. So we knew there would be a growth in demand along the um, pipeline development area. It was recognized by the UN that oil extraction areas have a detrimental impact on indigenous women and girls, including an increase in sexual assaults. Rural counties with limited resources um, would host what we termed the man camps. Thousands of mostly male workers placed in these constructed communities. Protest camps also emerge and have a, their own share of issues and violence. The U.S. Department of State noted that such camps in the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota resulted in an increase of sex, sexual exploitation of women in the area, and especially Native American women. Notably, OOBW released grants to deal with a spike against the women and the Bakken pipeline response. At that time, B. Hansen, the principal deputy director, stated local and tribal victim service providers have been overwhelmed with the increase in domestic violence and sexual assault victims coming forward and needing help. This initiative was to be proactive rather than reactive. We had the stats from the UNSECO, the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, Combating Violence Against Indigenous Women and Girls in the United Nations Declaration. We had information from the United States Department of State, the Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons, um, and the link between extractive industries and sex trafficking. And then we have data from the Office of violence against women um, regarding the tribal communities in the Bakken region. And those are all available online and I can send the links to to our host to share if that's what we needed. Thank you. Yeah, I can put those up on our um, on our website. We have a, um, a both an MMIW or MMIR page and a um, CO2 page that we can put these up on. And much like what North Dakota saw with Bakken and what South Dakota was going to face in many of the areas on um, these pipelines is the the victims will be isolated from services, both police and shelter. There'll be many times where response will be 90 minutes to reach um, an Indian Health Service clinic or to have police respond to an emergency. Um, our reservations span millions of acres. 
Um, there's disproportionate poverty rates. Many survivors do not have access to cars or the money needed for the gas required to reach the services. Partner agencies on our reservations were already having difficulty with transportation with the current funding that they receive from OVW and VOCA. So with no, res with no services available on these lands, um, we also looked at the where they did have services, the, um, what advocacy was available, what transportation services were available. And out there in the western part of South Dakota, there was often nothing for hundreds of miles. Yeah. The other issue, of course, was sane. Um, sadly, in order for these cases to become statistics, we have to have victims. And in order for the victims to move forward in the case, we have to have the evidence. And so SANE exams became critical, um, one, to ensure that um, our victims received appropriate care, um, trauma-informed care, medical care, mental health care, and all of that starts with a good SANE exam. So we um, invested in training SANE nurses and finding facilities that were rural to do like a telehealth, what we called eSANE, and provided the funding to get them the equipment that they needed to connect with larger hospitals like Avera um, to help guide the practitioners in those areas through those important exams. We've worked with the Center for Prevention of Child Maltreatment um, to make sure that we had adequate services for the youth that were affected because of what the parents and the adults in their lives were facing. Finally, it's a jurisdictional maze when it comes to the sexual assault of Native victims. Depending on who and where the crime occurred, the different law enforcement agencies and prosecutors become involved, which meant the communication between agencies was vital. Moreover, the experience dealing with the pipeline issues would be similar across the state. So learning from each other would help provide better solutions to best serve our victims. And this grant was to be able to help to create those MDT teams, those SART teams, um, those appropriate SANE exams, the advocates transport, the mechanism to transport interpreters if we needed it. Um, so we put all that in place and thankfully the pipeline was abandoned. However, the needs of those communities um, did not go away. We have an epidemic with MMI are in our area. We have an epidemic with sexual assaults still. We have um, issues with still the jurisdiction of where the crime occurred, who to report to. Was it native on native? Was it on the reservation? Did she report off the reservation? And so the, the work continues. The, the issues continue without um, having the pipeline in our backyard. So we continue to hire advocates um, we work with law enforcement and advocates to train so that we're speaking the same language so we can provide the appropriate services to our victims. And then we also have the transportation to drive to those places that don't have um, adequate services yet in their rural communities. Wow. So um, this was years in the making. Yes. Um, the data, the, the man camps started in 2019. We did not write the grant until 2020 or 2020, yeah. excuse me. Um, it was awarded. And so we're in our final year. And so yeah. we, we, we worked very, very as hard as you could during COVID without being able to meet face to face. Um, we worked our, the advocates, our, the, our shelters, our law enforcement, everybody was all hands on deck. We were prepared as best that we could, um, but still knew that in our rural areas, in our areas where there may be an executive director who also takes call, where the business officer also takes call, um, where there maybe is not a business officer and the executive director wears many hats, that it would be a 24 seven situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then when the camps came, um, with them came, um, workers from Keystone XL who wanted to create relationships with the communities to assure us that they would make every effort to ensure that the people that they hired passed background tests, that they were bringing their spouses. They were allowing spouses to come with them, thinking that if their spouses were there, they would 
not being so inclined yeah. to go to the town. No. Um, they were going to bring their own medical um, providers. So mm -hmm. nobody would have a reason to leave. Um, they were trying, they, they said they were trying to learn from the mistakes of Bakken um, to not have the same situation happen in South Dakota. I don't know what the new group's doing. Yeah, of course. We, we don't know anything, to be honest. We never know with these companies, to be honest. Um, and sometimes uh, these companies also lie to us, right? They say they're going to do these things, but they don't actually go through with them. But it is the advocacy of like groups like yours um, and like grassroots people and just like, you know, the fact that people were fighting this pipeline for over 10 years already that like made it possible to like bring this into fruition um, and this is why I was really happy to have you on this uh, on this webinar so that people could see like how uh, we can prepare for these eminent threats and um, what can come out of them. So thank you so much for talking to us about all this. I really appreciate it. And uh, we're going to have some questions at the end. So if you don't mind sticking around, that would be great. I'll be here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Um, our next guest is uh, Lisa Heth. Hello, Lisa. And um, <laughs> hello. Hi. Yeah, hi. Um, and um, I, I was really happy to have Lisa on this uh, uh, stream today because um, I want to talk about like what is going on currently as well. Like what is happening in Indian country and what are people doing right now to work on this issue in other areas? Um, uh, you know, like I think Lisa's gonna mention some stuff maybe about hunting camps and, you know, just just in general, like what are what are people facing in terms of colonial violence uh, in, in, in South Dakota because the pipeline will be going through there heavily as well. Um, Lisa, if you don't mind, please introduce yourself and, and um, give us some information. Yes. Uh, well, good evening, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak. I appreciate that. I'm I'm honored to be here and help in whatever way I can. And is, is that too much light? It's perfect. It's okay, great. great. <laughs> All right. So, uh, <clears throat> so I am the executive director for Wichoni Wawokia Incorporated, which is helping families on the Crow Creek Reservation. And I'm an enrolled member on the Lower Rural Sioux Tribe. Um, and so I mostly um, grew up most of my life here on the Crow Creek uh, Reservation. Um, and then, um, and so we have a shelter um, that's been operating for over, I think it's been like 37 years now. I've been with the program 31 years and excuse me, for um, over 31 years. <clears throat> and in 2015, um, we developed um, Pathfinder Center, which is a long-term um, human trafficking um, center for women. So it's a 14-bedroom um, shelter facility that um, is it has an AFA fence around it. It's completely secure. It has security cameras, a, a silent alarm. And so we provide long-term um, long uh, shelter for women um, that are wanting to come there. It's not short-term, so they have to want to come for long-term because we know that victims of sex um, trafficking have a lot of trauma issues and um, housing them temporary for 30 days is not going to help them in any way. And so that's why we want to make a difference in their lives. And that's the uh, reason why we call it uh, helping them to find their purpose. So in 2015, when we were looking, um, actually, we used to have a shelter um, that was under, that was under us, um, that was in Sioux Falls, it was a place for native um, women. It was called Mushke Mish, Tiki, um, Mita Mushke Tiki Shelter. And it served the native population there because a lot of our native women were not getting the culturally appropriate services that they needed. They weren't being treated uh, with the respect or any cultural sensitivity at all. So um, that was um, developed through the South Dakota Ending Domestic Violence and Sexual Assault. 
And I think it was after three years, they asked us to um, take it under our wings. So, which we did, we had it under our wings for six years. And during probably the last three years that we had it, we've seen a large increase of, of sex trafficking victims coming to um, Mita. And so, and word got out that Mita was taking these women in. And not only were a lot of the women native, but they were also... Um, sex trafficking so to move um ahead quickly um one of the things then um so so unfortunately um we could um no longer um keep funding mita um we did not get uh funding for it and i had to worry about um you know our shelter and our services on our reservation and so um, so we had to shut Mita down. And at that time, we were looking at, um, well, I got a call from a guy and we, I went and looked at this building and that. And so it's not something that I was really looking to do, um, a shelter for sex trafficking victims. However, it was, um, I've seen the need for it. And as I was looking at it, I really prayed like, you know, okay, you know, um, and so the, the you know, it, it's like the creator was showing me that we needed something long term uh, for trafficking victims. So um, lo and behold, that's kind of how it started. And um, it's and everything came together for the funding um, to open um, funding to open up and it, it everything just really fell into mm -hmm. to place. And it took us two years to get the facility um, ready, um, all the rooms. So one of the things is that we've really found out is, you know, the intersection between uh, MMIR and <clears throat> and sex trafficking, that um, there is that intersection that a lot of our um, women or young women are being taken um, so that they can be sex trafficked. Um, wherever there are a large group of men men camps where there's sports events where there's hunting where there's fishing and a lot of our um reservations do um open up huntings to non-natives uh, from out of state to come to come to our reservations and, and, so you, and you have directly seen an increase in sex trafficked victims during these hunting seasons Is oh yeah i mean we had a woman um, that we uh, got from out of state, um, and she was not um, she was not native, and but she was from out of state, and um, she had told us because we told her nothing about Lorboro because Pathfinder Center is not located on the reservation; it's located 25 miles um, from um, Fort Thompson, which is on a Crow Creek reservation. So. Um, so she didn't, you know, we didn't tell her anything about any of the reservations. And, you know, one day she tells us about, um, oh, I know where Laura Brew Reservation is. And so one of the um, advocates says, okay, how do you know about that? And she said, because that was one of the places I was taken to to um, be sex trafficked. And, um, and we were like, wow. And so... About a month later, we got another woman in, and this was a, a indigenous woman. She come from the um, another reservation in the state, and she too said that she had been taken to Lorbrul to be trafficked there. Is, are there hunting and, camps in the area? There are hunting lodges there. Hunting so, lodges, yeah, where they yeah. pay the money and they get to go. Yeah, I mean, I can't say what specific lodges, I mean, hunting lodges that they are, but all over in South Dakota, I mean, we're coming into the hunting season here um, soon. And so a lot of, there's a lot of places that have developed, you know, hunting lodges that um, out-of-staters come in and they, you know, rent the place, you know, for a week. Well, I I don't think that some of these don't have the intention of that some of these guys are going to be, I mean, that women are going to be brought there to be sex trafficked. But this is this is my kind of my belief that 
there are traffickers out there that know that they can take these women to these hunting lodges and um and take them there and that there is is that um what do you call it um well that that men will purchase them and the same you know with with uh, uh fishing season as well um we look at our casinos you know fishermen they go to the casinos hunters mm -hmm. go to the casino they play blackjack they're looking for um women um and asking, you know, if there are any available, um, uh, you know, so that's, you know, another thing is, you know, getting our casinos educated and aware on a lot of the issues of, you know, hunters and fishermen coming in and anybody suspicious. And I know our local casinos, we have been able to provide, you know, the education awareness, like what to look for. Yeah. And and it's really brought up the awareness like, oh, yeah, um, we've seen that or, you know, now that you mention it. And so when we get that awareness out, then people start looking and they start um, saying something. So when they see something, they say something. And so in the last year and a half, so we've been able to get funding. Actually, Pathfinder Center is all funded on foundational um, money um, donations. So we don't operate on uh, federal funding. And it's kind of nice because we don't have to like jump through their hoops or anything. Um, so in one of our particular foundational um, uh, grants, they allowed us to put um, money in there that we can um, help to, um, you know, with families, um, with MMIW, MMI, um, our relatives that we can help, you know, search for them or help them bring them home. And so in the last year and a half, we were able to bring three, um, native women back and that were, had been missing. One was a young girl. She was 16 at the time. And um, she had been missing for about five months. Grandma had reported it to law enforcement. Um, she never kind of really followed up with it. So there wasn't really like a anything put out. She 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 was the kind of grandma that didn't, you know, raise a lot of of, um, you know, she she just wasn't very pushy. Um, so she came to us and she had told us that um, she got a call from. Colorado and uh, that the hospital had her granddaughter there and they had found the law enforcement had found her granddaughter walking on one of the highways skimpy clothing out of it and so anyway um, grandma had to come and get her and they wouldn't release her until grandma did so um, and we know that she was being trafficked because she had been taken to um, Sioux Falls so we flew grandma out uh, up here and she was able to grab, you know, go and get her granddaughter and then um, bring her um, fly back the same day. And so we, you know, set up for law enforcement to talk to her, you know, to find out like how did this happen and um, so that they can interview her and help her to, you know, I mean, try to, um, you know, get her the help that she um that she needed, that she needed. Yeah. and then um then we had two of them um we, we had one that was um taken to texas and so um her uh she somehow got a hold of her mother and her mother contacted us and then we were able to bring her and her son back wow and, and so these and are all sex trafficking these are all women that were missing yeah. That are always they, under, at your shelter. Pardon? All, that you deal with sex trafficking more or less specifically at your shelter. Right. And so oh. so the the last one that we, um, you know, we dealt with was um, she was a, a Native woman out of Rapid City. Her um, mother called um, actually down to the tribe and then the um, tribe referred her to us and so we were able i was able to you know talk with her per, i mean that was that was real a real real nail biter because it took like three four days to get her back because she was beaten up 
Um, it, and um, she was trying to, they were trying to stop her anyway. And I tell you what, the one thing um, working in this field, I mean, there's a lot of people that are jumping on the bandwagon that are doing, you know, doing this work and that, but <clears throat> sometimes it's really hard to find that connection and work when it's out of state and you find all these uh, numbers to call and you either get no response or like one of the uh, numbers, it says, leave your number and we'll get back to you the next day. And I'm like, what? Well, this is not a crisis line. And then, <clears throat> Then we found um, some volunteers who would pick her up to take her to the airport. But then they wanted us to place her in a motel close to the airport that was closer and more convenient for them. And it's like, well, isn't it this supposed to be about, you know, the victim and, you know, not about yeah. her own convenience? So, so that was there's a lack of there's a lack of structure already that, you know, from even the federal and state levels. And we're trying to deal with grassroots and whatever to folks to make it happen is what it yeah. sounds like. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So, so the thing is, is I, you know, I know that a lot of, you know, that's why it's very, very important, you know, that when a, a, a teenager, um, uh, women are taken, uh, young men, um, cause let's not forget about those that we know that is happening to them as well. They're yes. just yeah. not coming um, forward. Yes. So when they go missing, the thing is, is to act on it right away. Um, call law enforcement. You don't have to wait 24 hours, 12 hours, you know, any of that. Um, yeah, our yeah. local law enforcement says, no, you call us, especially if it's a youth. You know, they no longer look at them as a runaway. They look at them as an endangered youth. So oh. the more that we get information out, because once they're taken out of state, it, it really even makes it. Um, harder for um, harder to find. To find. Um, thank you. Yeah. Th and thank you so much. Um, we have to get moving to our next guest, but um, I did want to check one other thing with you quickly. Um, sporting events, right? Like that's also an issue. Sporting events. Well, and then don't forget the Sturgis rally that happens thank up in the you. Black yes, Hills. The Sturgis rally. Yes. Yep. That's, so there's all that's sorts of other issues. And, and basically, um, the reason I really wanted, uh, and I'm thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you so much. Yeah. I wanted you to paint the picture of what people are already dealing with in Indian country. We all, all we are already dealing with a huge, huge crisis, and um, and you, we've had this conversation already. But you know, uh, we we talked about bringing in these these pipelines. That is not going to make things any easier. Um, yes. And so that's why I really wanted you here today because you are at the front lines. You are, you know, saving people. You are getting them from out of these circumstances, and you've seen firsthand how bad it can get. So, um, um, anything we can do to help. Thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate it. And if anybody wants to reach out, go to our our website, pathfindercenter.net yes. or dot org. It's pretty easy to find. And so. I, I put your um, the link to uh, uh, with Choni Ways as well in there. Um, yeah. Yep. That's our okay. other website for the show, okay. um, domestic violence. Okay, and um, I'll find the Pathfinders link um, right okay. away. And then I also put a link to the South Dakota um, Network Against uh, uh, Sexual Absolutely. Violence and Sexual Assault, which yes. is Tanya's organization. So we're gonna thank you so much. And if you don't mind sticking around, we're gonna uh, just you know if, if there's questions, we'll just get to those right after okay. Trish. Thank you so okay. much. Yes, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk to Trisha Ottringer next um, from Great Plains Action Society. And um, thank you so much for being here, Trisha. Thank and you. <laughs> Trisha's the yeah, um, MMIR and Operations Director uh, at our organization. And uh, Trisha, I'll let you introduce yourself and um, speak about why you're here today. Well, hello, everyone. Good evening. My name is Trisha Ettringer, and I am the Director of Operations slash uh, MMIR, Director for Great Plains Action Society. Um, I'm located in Sioux City, Iowa. And yeah, so we're basically on here to talk about kind of what we do here at Great Plains Action Society. Um, so yeah, um, was there a specific question that you want me to start off with, Christine? Well, um... Let's start off by talking about um, 
what is the scene like right now uh, in Nebraska and Iowa? Um, okay. I did, I kind of I I let some stats kind of come out earlier. I forgot like I had it. In oh, my, that's okay. Don't worry should, about it. Um, I, I think people should be here. Um, <laughs> what we're dealing with already, and also um, like we you know some of the people like you know some of the the, the names that have to be said of the victims. Mm-hmm. Uh, that you know have been taken in the area and why it's important that we need to talk about this for sure for sure so um again we're in sioux city iowa which is a tri-state area so we border nebraska and south dakota which in a political uh engagement realm of things they are very hard uh to kind of be indigenous in um and also just you know anything that you know black and brown bodies in general um so as far as like the in regards to sex trafficking we do have major highways that intersect um in sioux city again um bordering um states and neighboring uh first tribal nations such as the winnebago and the omaha and then we also have major cities such as omaha nebraska and sioux falls so there's just a big corridor you know of people just going in and out um i think minnesota is about like four hours away um But uh, as far as like uh, what's going on here, I know that uh, the Woodbury County uh, Board of Supervisors has indeed uh, opposed. They've written a letter to the Iowa Utilities Board stating their opposition to not only the Navigator, but also the Summit Pipeline. Um, I do believe that the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska also has uh, asked for an environment, an environmental impact study to be done um, regarding, you know, just, you know, just basically, you know, how this is going to impact uh, their land as far as, you know, the land around them. Um, but also, um, the FBI actually released a news uh, uh, article, or there was an article that was, you know, released. Um, the FBI announced uh, the results of a nationwide sex trafficking operation. And so um, from that, it was out of Omaha, Nebraska. And I want to say that they located 84 minor victims. And then I think the youngest one was about 11 years old. Um, I can't remember exactly if they kind of uh, put the more finer details to that. Um, But the fact is is that it's it's here it's been going on um the we do we uh great plains action society are on uh indigenous voices rising so that is a grant with unl um it is a community you know you said you unl oh UNL. Yep. North yeah. university of lincoln yes yeah yep. Yep, yep, yep. and so basically that is um it's a community-based indigenous led research project that was created in response to the urgent call from native American elders, advocates, and crisis responders for more information that can be used to prevent sex trafficking for, uh, of indigenous, uh, persons. Um, the four year, uh, project is funded by a grant, uh, from the U S department of justice, national Institute of justice. So we are currently working with them. I know we are on a, Another grant to um, also kind of uh, creating, um, you know, just kind of where do where can we get the research data and how do we basically own that data too as well mm-hmm. or how do we keep that? I shouldn't say own. We don't we should never own, uh, you know, something so sacred because um, these are these are community members. So um so the, that's kind of like the the climate around here there's already opposition to these pipelines um there's you know a large population of natives that live here in sioux city so um it does pose a lot of threats um especially when it comes to sex trafficking because i feel like you know we already fall through the cracks so much as is and we're we're still trying to create the resources um obviously because the resources that are available um are Are very limited so um that was another thing too to mention is that um i recently started the protect the sacred workshop um which um there's different components to that so the healing justice component the sex trafficking prevention the self-defense the 
uh, organizing, learning how to organize within your own communities and build power. I think uh, I'm really excited for it. And um, we just had our first class last weekend and we did a, a nice introduction uh, to kind of get into what we're going to uh, dig into basically. So um, yeah, so that's kind of what I've been working on in Sioux City. I'm not sure if you have any other questions. Absolutely. Um, well, I, again, I just want to put out this statistic uh, about, you know, Omaha, for instance, which is like mm -hmm. only an hour and a half from Sioux City. So I know yes. this is also very relevant in Sioux City um, that, um, you know, Omaha is, you know, eighth in the nation for cities um, that have missing and murdered Indigenous women. And the state of Nebraska is seventh in the nation for states that have missing and murdered Indigenous women. Yes. Um, and that, um, like, the communities where these pipelines are really merging, like these pipelines are really coming. And I, I for, please forgive me everybody, because I was going to have a map uh, ready to go and it actually just drifted out of my mind. But if you go <laughs> online and you type in navigator pipeline and summit pipeline, you'll see how heavily they come in uh, to the, Om like they come up through Omaha, Sioux City, and then they go up into Sioux Falls and then up, you know, then go, they go further west a little bit um, up into uh, Bismarck all the way through South Dakota. But they, they kind of like have tendrils coming off them because they go into, you know, all these like carbon capture areas where they're going to take the, the CO2. Um, and so I wanted Trish here today to help paint the picture of like, you know, what we're facing. And already Trish works with, um, you know, um, or I wouldn't, well, works uh, and supports um, several families that have been lost to the missing and murdered uh, Indigenous uh, relatives uh, crisis. And um, I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit, like just like how it's it happens more than you think, you know, it just it happens a lot. I think there's different layers uh, when we talk about MMIR. And I think that this is just another like perpetuation of modern day colonization. Of course, mm -hmm. you know, this is um, directly um, extracting from the lands. And and not only that, like um, when it comes to our families, um, you know, some of these have happened on the reservations. They've um, you know, we had Zachary Bear Hills, um, which was a very unfortunate, um, you know, tragedy that happened in Omaha, Nebraska. So um, I don't know if I can, uh, you know, as far as like sex trafficking, I know that it does happen, um, but I, I'm not entirely sure if like I know personally, like, you know. Well, we don't have the stats. Yeah. And no, no, I wasn't yeah. just talking about sex trafficking. I'm talking about missing yeah. people, murdered people, you know. Oh, like, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. My bad. Um, but yes, yes, um, that does happen a lot. And we have, you know, um, the late Terry McCauley. Um, we've had, you know, uh, most recently we had, uh, um, I won't say the name, uh, just to be respectful to the family, but we did have a Santee Sioux uh, girl that did go missing and murdered. And, you know, it's, it's just every time it never gets easier. Um, it just it hurts every single time and um even my own auntie um she went missing in the 80s and you know it's just and you guys so were just giving that her remains like last year no because the pandemic happened <laughs> and then they <laughs> lost the paperwork so we're still in the process of like getting her back and and uh making sure that she's laid to rest right and next this is to 30 her. years later yes pretty much yeah yep mm -hmm. so it, it never is easy to, uh, you know, it's never easy at all. This work is is very hard. Um, and I do, I, sh I shout out to all the grassroots organizers and um, all the people that actually, you know, are on the ground and, and, you know, have to, or, you know, don't have to, but they do it because they know they, they, they feel that call. So I definitely want to acknowledge all the people that really, do put in the work for that. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, you have been involved in fighting, you know, the Dakota Access Pipeline and KXL. And so you're very aware of like, you know, the danger of man camps. And so can you tell me from your, you know, um, um, experience and knowledge, which you have a lot of in this realm, like that, mm -hmm. like you think that these will cause issues? I think so. I think um, there was an incident that happened here in Iowa, even. Uh, I think it was a nonviolent direct action where uh, one of 
our Omaha relatives had her daughter um, with her at this action and this pipeline worker, they had it on film and he comes up and he says, hey, how much for your daughter or how much for that one? For the girl. And it was just like, oh my gosh, like I couldn't even like how blatantly, you know, just it, there was no like regard you know, there was people all around that were watching um, to be bold like that and to and to think that you can say that to our women. Um, it's just it's very sickening. Um, there was another gosh, what was it? Um, I'm losing my my train of thought here. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, so <laughs> me, me and Mahmoud went out and uh, this was during KXL <laughs> and you know, we were we were doing some filming and uh, we had uh, we were harassed, basically. Um, you know, we were we were far away and, you know, it wasn't like we were up in their business. Um, but, you know, we were there and we wanted to, to let them know that we were there. Um, so we had a pipeline worker that came up and this is during the, the pandemic. And so KXL is, you know, advocating, you know, oh, we're following, you know, COVID protocol and this and that. And um, the pipeline worker or security guard that came up um, was like really like in my face. And I was like, hold on, like, <laughs> do you have like, aren't you supposed to be wearing a mask or like you need to, you know, you need to back up because you're not wearing a mask and you should be wearing a mask. And so, again, that poses a threat to our communities um, when we have transient workers that come from out of state and um, especially during a pandemic like that just was not you know, that was not okay, um, you know, for, for these companies and corporates and, you know, these factories or whatever that to come in and say that, oh, you know, we care about you, your health is our number one. And, you know, but then you have something like that happen. And, you know, he's in my face, it's during the pandemic, and you guys are still out here working like that's just, yeah, I don't know. So that was kind of like my show you, yeah, it shows you how little they seem to care about the health and safety of the people that they're saying they're there to protect, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's like a precursor to how they may or may not deal with uh, any um, issues of violence that they bring into communities. Yes, they have no, they don't, they don't care as long as they can dig into the ground and do their, you know, extracting and capitalize off of it. They do not care. And you're also a member of the Winnebago Nation. Yes. So um, your nation uh, put out a, um, a request for an environmental impact study. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, do you also also too, we have two Woodbury County uh, landowners here that um, are being sued by one of the pipelines. Yeah. And I don't even think one I don't even think they have their permits yet. I don't even think yeah. they, you know, so they're yeah, the fight has really revolved the fight has really revolved around white landowners right now, actually, yes. concerning this fight. And that's why we're having this talk tonight, actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually I will um yeah, that's a really good way to, to end our conversation, actually. Um that you know, we're here to uplift like this issue in Indian country and for black, uh, Latino, Latina and migrant folks and for all the BIPOC folks actually that are not being heard in this fight. Yes. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Trish. I really appreciate it. I'm going to keep you up here because I'm going to bring everybody back on. Okay. Um, <laughs> hope you all ready, Lisa and Tanya. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I don't even think we have questions today. I guess we were just very thorough. Um, <laughs> so, um, but I thought we could just come back on for like a couple minutes of conversation. Um, firstly, just, um, I want to say thank you to everybody. And um, I wanted to just provide everybody like an opportunity to say anything in case, you know, anything was missed. I don't think so. I, I know that we are looking for funding to ensure sustainability of what we started. One of the detriments of grant funding is their, their shelf life isn't long. Yes. And the, the FAST grant has brought together a lot of wonderful people to the table who are all victim focused and really, really want to make a difference to ensure that our, um, our relatives have the best access to care. Lisa's part of the team and she brings a wealth of knowledge, as do many of our other partners, like I said earlier, both tribal and non-tribal. And we want to be able to continue to do the good work that we've started and move forward um, to ensure that 
whatever the next thing is that happens, whether it's hunting season, which has already started in Indian country. It started last week. Um, grouse season is open. And so West River um, big game is open for archery. So that has already started. Um, and then the stock show is coming up um, where um, they, that us also is notorious for human trafficking um, and women go missing after those events. So um, we are working with all of our partners to ensure that we stay ready and that we are alert and that we recognize that it's also not just these events, but sometimes it's familial and we have to be mindful of that. Sometimes it's in our own backyard and to be vigilant when it comes to our education so that we can prevent future victims. And I just want to say like the fast grant was put into place specifically to ward off the violence that the KXL pipeline would bring in. So I'm so glad you guys are set up already in South Dakota because the pipe, these CO2 pipelines are coming, you know? And, and we've been, um, fortunately the network has, is able to go to the Capitol and listen to legislation. And so we were aware of the first filings of the CO2, um, Grant or pipeline. Um, of course, they're so vague, you know, when those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, it probably would have been the summit pipeline. That yeah. Way. And so we were tracking that um, in our fast and updating each other as to what we heard and knew that it was going to be in that Sisseton Wapton area and kind of east and north of where we are and had them ready um, and pre starting to think about gaps in services and the intersection between sexual violence and our missing and murdered indigenous relatives and, and the uptick that would happen in the event of a large scale project like a pipeline. Um, we've also had some other situations with like grain bends along the train tracks that also bring in a, a quick bunch of people to quickly put up the grain bends and leave. And with them comes methamphetamines. And with that comes, can you bring some people to party and we'll share our methamphetamines and then that you have a human trafficking um, starting. Like Trisha mentioned, can you bring your daughter when you come next time? Um, just blatantly asking for oh my God. younger participants and other participants to join them. And, oh, sorry. I just, I get like sometimes kind of nauseous feeling when we talk about these things. Um, I, I wanted to say uh, Navigator's coming next. I just wanted to let you know, like they'll be filing soon in South Dakota. So um, they're, they're the next pipeline that's like, cause there's three of them, right. That are, but the navigator and summit ones are the two that'll be coming through Indian country. So just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, and, uh, thank you so much, Tanya, for that extra information. And if there's anything else, Trisha or Lisa, you'd like to say, um, I'd like to give you the opportunity. Well, thank you. Well, <clears throat> I just wanted to say, you know, one of the things is, you know, as grassroots people is, um, sometimes, you know, we can't wait. We can't wait for the feds to come in and, and save us. And, um, you know, sometimes even our over our own law enforcement, uh, especially I know our law enforcement is BIA. And so a lot of the times um, they're short on law enforcement officers or sometimes they're um, they're sent to another reservation to um, to help them out. And sometimes we, you know, we'll get um, some here that are temporary to help us out. So they don't know our community like we do. So <clears throat> one of the things is that we um, developed about um, two years ago is uh, a human trafficking um, task force. They, in South Dakota, they do have a West River and uh, East River human trafficking task force. Um, however, we decided, you know, for Crow Creek and Lower Rural, let's develop a task force. When I talked to both chairmen, I said, we need to get this going. I've been hearing a lot of things about young girls <clears throat> really being taken off our reservations, being taken to, especially, especially Sioux Falls. And <clears throat> so, um, so that's how we got developed. And now we're looking at, uh, well, we also then two other tribes joined us. And so we're looking at, you know, having um, it, we changed the name to All Nations Human Trafficking Task Force, which would, of course, you know, we would deal with the 
um, MMIWR issues as well. But I think it's important that all the reservations that we share that information because traffickers just don't look at one reservation. You know, they're looking at other reservations as well. So if we can share that information on who's coming uh, on our reservations, this is that same person, um, are they being taken to the same place? So if we're sharing that information with each other, um, then um, the more that we share with each other. And so when I talk about, you know, our task force, we're looking, you know, at the, you know, local um, law enforcement, you know, the advocates and, um, you know, the people who uh, boots on the ground that we can share with each other. So I think that it's really important that if we, you know, come to together and especially, the you know, the thing is, is we need to really make a call out to our men to become, you know, the warriors who um, Creator God has made them to be, that they're supposed to be our protectors of the women and children, and they need to step up and they need to, um, you know, be be in this uh, fight against, um, you know, MMIW, MMIR, uh, human trafficking. So we're not going to see crime go down on the reservations until our men start, you know, um, stepping up and that they get the healing that they need as well mm -hmm. so that they can join us uh, in eradicating the, this violence on our reservation and our women and our children being taken. So right. thank you. Right on. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Um, any words, Trisha? Not really. I feel like <laughs> both the ladies have uh, really touched on a lot of uh, things that I just can't, you know, add on to it. Um, I do want to say thank you for coming on here and, and sharing your knowledge with us. And I hope to have future collaborations with you both. And um, yes, I, I definitely have to echo what Lisa was saying as far as um, we as grassroots people, um, we just have to create those proactive solutions uh, to, to our own problems because um, obviously the reactive uh, solutions that we have now are not working. And um, you know, I think it's uh, long overdue, um, you know, the healing part of it too. That's a lot of part or a lot of uh, the healing justice work. Um, so I just want to say thank you again for, for touching on everything that you have talked about tonight. And uh, thank you to our audience for being here. Um, if you would like any more information, uh, please go to um, uh, Tanya's um, uh, uh, site, um, South Dakota um, uh, Network. No, network yeah. is a network against. Network for short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, against. Uh, um, Sec yeah, domestic. Yeah, the sexual, the South Dakota Network Against Family Violence and Sexual Assault. Thank you. I'm so sorry. It's a long, uh, a long. It way. is. <laughs> in the beginning. Yes, and Lisa um, founded Wachoni uh, uh, Ways. Or sorry, the name of the Wachoni Wawokia. Wawokia. Um, you can go to wachoniways.org or mm -hmm. pathfindercenter.org, which is the Human Trafficking Center. So yes. we have a lot of good information on there. So. Yes, please do that. Um, and then, of course, you can go to greatplainsaction.org and check out our Missing and Murdered Indigenous Relatives page, plus our CO2 Pipelines page, so you can get more information on what's going on there. Um, and, uh, you know, these pipelines and all these other projects and all these man camps and all these hunting camps and all these sporting events, they better watch out because like we're just, you know, growing and getting stronger um, and creating more barriers uh, for them to come into our communities and cause harm. So have a good evening, everybody. And thank you for being here. Thank you.